In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly King, Paraclete, Spirit of Truth, You who are everywhere present and fill all things, treasury of all that is good, and master of life, come, dwell within us, cleanse us from all stain, and save our souls, O good one. Mary, cause of our joy, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we're going to discuss today uh, the third Sunday in this in Lent, in the cycle B. But before we start, um, we're going to look at one of the most important and groundbreaking parts of Dei Verbum. Its title of this whole section is The Liturgy, Privileged Setting for the Word of God. And um, we began it last time. I want to pick up where it starts with the liturgical year. Um, Here one sees the sage pedagogy of the Church, which proclaims and listens to sacred scripture following the rhythm of the liturgical year. This expansion of God's Word in time takes place above all in the Eucharistic celebration and in the Liturgy of the Hours. And this is a point we've discussed before, how, see, time is taken up into the life of the Church. And whatever time is in the Church is preserved. Whatever time is not is lost. And so that's the role of the Liturgy in the broadest sense. That is, saying the Liturgy of the Hours and all those things that belong to this whole religious liturgical movement. See? At the center of everything, the Paschal mystery shines forth and around it radiates all the mysteries of Christ and the history of salvation which become sacramentally present. I think we looked at some of this last time, but I wanted to go back of it, of it to uh, consider it again. Huh? What is unique about biblical religion is that God acts in history. All the other um, religious ceremonies of all the other nations center around life in this world. Praying for and celebrating a good harvest, or victory in war, or all those things. Only in the biblical religion do we celebrate those acts of God in history starting with creation, but then the exodus, the death and resurrection of Christ, and all the ones that contribute to those. They're called mysteria, mysteries, because the agent in that act is God, and therefore it has an infinite depth. So when we commemorate it, we are bringing ourselves into touch with it. Uh, I've read out for you several times that quote from uh, Pope Leo the Great, St. Leo the Great. You see that all the things that he did and said are present now to us at the liturgy. That's the mysterion, the mysteries of the life of Christ, meaning all those things that he did. St. Thomas Aquinas was the last theologian to treat of all the different acts in the life of Christ. His conception, his birth, his circumcision, his holy life with Mary, his preaching, because they're all acts of the Word. And so he considered them as part of the saving work of God among us. And they're quite profound. Now we've gone back to an understanding of that as the liturgy has once again become more prominent in our spiritual lives. One of the great forerunners of this, there were two. One was in Belgium, though he was Irish, uh, Dom Columba Marmion, he was an Irishman, but he was the abbot of Maritsu, a Belgian monastery in, in uh, a Benedictine monastery in Belgium. The other is Dom Guéranger uh, in uh, 
France at Solem. And they were great giants of liturgical renewal. And so that's what he's talking about here. And then we have this quote uh, from the document Sacro Sanctum Concilium. By recalling in this way the mysteries of the redemption, the Church opens up to the faithful the riches of the saving actions and the merits of her Lord and makes them present to all times, allowing the faithful to enter into contact with them and to be filled with the grace of salvation. You see, and that's why, as these two men recovered for us, by the way, you may not know this, but St. Therese of Lisieux just devoured Garanger's commentary on the liturgical year, which was multi-volume. I didn't know that. And um, some 50 or 60 years later, when I was just a young fellow beginning, I devoured them. I read every line of every volume, multi-volume commentary uh, by Garanger on the liturgy. Um, and I'm so grateful that I did. And so, you see, by recalling in this way the mysteries of the redemption, the Church opens up to the faithful the riches of the saving actions and the merits of her Lord and makes them present to all times, allowing the faithful to enter into contact with them and to be filled with the grace of salvation. We are touched by these. Right now, as we are preparing in Lent for the Paschal Mystery, you see, um, Paul says in Romans 4.25, Christ died for our sins and rose for our justification. We are justified by the power of the resurrection. That's where the justification comes from. You see? So for this reason, I encourage the church's pastors and all engaged in pastoral work to see that all the faithful learn to savor the deep meaning of the word of God, which unfolds each year in the liturgy revealing the fundamental mysteries of our faith. This is, in turn, the basis for a correct approach to sacred scripture. When we read scripture, we are meant to come in contact with that act of God in Christ and have that touch our own spirit. That's the work of scripture, as you've heard me say quite a few times. But, I mean, that's the great tradition. Um, one of the quotes I like best is that one where Aquinas is talking, commenting on Dionysius's um, hierarchy, I think, where he says, see, all other writings nourish the mind. Scriptures nourish the soul. Now, what does that mean? One of these times, I'm going to stop and try to give a talk on that. It's so important. That's what we mean by the power of the word. Now, the Pope moves on to number 53. Um, I just wondered. Um, yes. In discussing the importance of the liturgy for understanding the Word of God, the Synod of Bishops highlighted the relationship between sacred scripture and the working of the sacraments. There is great need for a deeper investigation of the relationship between word and sacrament in the church's pastoral activity and in theological reflection. What is, you see, now Augustine has summed it up as usual in a very pithy, Accetit verbum ad elementum et fit sacramentum. The word comes to the element, water, bread, wine, oil, absolution, you see. And when the when the, the verbum comes, the, the preached word, the word of salvation comes, then there's, you see, it's the gospel. And the gospel pronounced over this element, this element becomes a medium of grace. I could stay there all day and recite the words, but if I don't pour water, there's no baptism. We are that involved in matter. But it's the verbum which comes to the elementum. That's why there's a sacramentum. That's what he's saying here. Certainly the liturgy of the word is a decisive element 
in the celebration of each one of the sacraments of the church. In pastoral practice, however, the faithful are not always conscious of this connection, nor do they appreciate the unity between the gesture and the word. And then uh, he begins to quote now uh, from uh, the document on the interpretation of the Bible from the Pontifical Biblical Commission. It is the task of priests and deacons, above all, when they administer the sacraments to explain the unity between word and sacrament in the mystery of the church. Now, as we're going to see later on, he takes this and says, analogously, you see, just as the word effects in the sacrament, so analogously, the word in the Gospels, preached, pronounced and preached, brings about an effect. It's a performative word. And here the Pope uses that word, performative language. Performative language, I think I talked about this last time. Performative language, I now pronounce you man and wife. They're man and wife. I christen you the battleship Potemkin. It's the battleship Potemkin. It happens by those words. Now those words have their effect by a societal agreement. But the word of the Lord has its effect by its own intrinsic power and signification. And that's what performative language is. You see, in fact, the relationship between word and sacramental gesture is the liturgical expression of God's activity in the history of salvation. God's activity in the history of salvation through the performative character of the word itself. In salvation history, there is no separation between what God says and what he does. His word appears as alive and active, as the Hebrew term Dabar itself makes clear. Even today we say, if you like, uh, what is this thing happening in modern Hebrew? Okay. In the liturgical action, too, we encounter his word which accomplishes what it says. By educating the people of God to discover the performative character of God's word in the liturgy, we will help them to recognize his activity in Satan's salvation history and in their individual lives. Our God is living and active, and so is his word. And now we come to the section uh, number 54 about the Eucharist, where all of this is in a particular way made very dense and very active. What has been said in general about the relationship between the word and the sacraments takes on a deeper meaning when we turn to the celebration of the Eucharist. The profound unity of word and Eucharist is grounded in the witness of Scripture, John 6, Luke 24, attested to by the fathers of the Church and reaffirmed, reaffirmed by the Vatican Council. Here we think of Jesus' discourse on the bread of life in the synagogue at Capernaum, which is in John 6, with its underlying comparison between Moses and Jesus, between the one who spoke face to face with God and the one who makes God known. Jesus' discourse on the bread speaks of the gift of God which Moses obtained for his people with the manna in the desert, which is really the Torah, the life-giving word of God. And that's a, a um, beautiful Jewish tradition, just as the commentators uh, in the line, and they couldn't find any water. They were without water. They were deprived of water. Commentators say that means they were deprived of Torah. God's word, God's teaching, God's presence, God's instructing. And so, uh, we'll take that up next time uh, from there. I think you can see how important it is to understand this, huh? All right.